Thank you very much. My talk today is called, it's called How to Aim Your Ambition. How to Aim Your Ambition. And if we're honest, ambition is one of those things which we feel slightly conflicted about. We feel a bit confused about. When we see it in some people, say in athletes, we really admire it. We look at the way their, their single-minded ambition drives them forward to be the strongest, the fastest, the most skillful, the way it forces them and, and, and enables them to hone their habits and sharpen their skill sets, to train their bodies to win the gold. And we look at them and we admire their ambition. But then there are other people, politicians, for example, to pick a slightly random example, <laughs> when we see ambition in them, it feels like ambition is a dirty word. We talk about ruthless ambition, naked ambition, even blind ambition. And we look at their ambition and we think it makes them into scheming, calculating people. That they would walk over someone to get ahead that they only care for themselves, that their only focus is on more for them and they would stab someone in the back if it meant they went higher <laughs> up the ladder. So we feel a bit like ambition isn't a good thing. And I remember being in a car when I uh, worked as a, as a barrister in a taxi driving to court and one of the senior guys I was working with described someone else we both knew and he said, he's very ambitious. And he made it sound like he had an infectious disease. <laughs> so when we see ambition in those around us, in those close to us, maybe in colleagues or in friends or even in ourselves, we can find it a bit uncomfortable. But what if there was such a thing as godly ambition? What if there was a way a secret to discovering a kind of ambition which wasn't just a good thing but was actually indispensable to seeing God's purposes in your life fulfilled? What if there was a way of working out how to aim your ambition in the right direction and how to see your ambition come to pass? How to achieve your ambition. Well, there is a secret, and it's found in our passage for today, Philippians 3 from verse 10. And it's on page 1190 in your blue Bibles, and it will also be on the screens. Paul writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider it myself yet to have taken hold. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, God will make that clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers and sisters, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters... You whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. So the first key, the first key is to take aim. It's so important to know what you're aiming at. 
We all have some kind of ambition, whether you're aware of it or not, whether it's open or hidden, whether you've articulated it or you've never expressed it, you are aiming your life towards some goal. But the key question is, what are you ambitious for? Because ambition is not a dirty word. It's the desire, the kickstart, the motivation that gets you moving. It sees how things are and wants them to be different. There's no ambition without hope that things can be changed, that the world can be transformed. Ambition's not a dirty word. Without dreams, you die. Without goals, there's no growth. Fear holds you back, but ambition can propel you forwards. But ambition can only operate in the service of a desire. What matters is what are you ambitious for? What are you aiming at? What you aim for tells you what you long for. And it can be quite hard to work out what you should aim for. There are so many different voices out there about what we should aim our lives toward. Aim for this, go for this, go hard over this. This is the most important thing. No, it's this, it's this, maybe it's this. How do you know what to aim for? I was uh, born and bred in Luton, a beautiful town just north of London. And uh, we we grew up in quite a rough area of Luton and... uh, you know, there could have been some trouble, but I had a little crew, and we would drive around the uh, estate in my uh, friend's car, and, and we thought we looked quite dangerous, we thought we looked pretty cool, um, and no one really bothered us at all, and we thought that was because we looked quite dangerous and cool. And this is my mate Sachin's car, as you can see. Um, on reflection, I think the reason they didn't bother us, because they didn't want to come anywhere near that. They didn't want to be seen dead near that car. Um, But one day we were driving around and and someone had left a bottle of milkshake in the car. And, you know, young young guys, we'd left it in there for week upon week upon week upon week upon week. And the milkshake had sort of started to turn into a cheese shake. Uh, And it was interesting the different colours it had started to go. And even though it was in a plastic bottle, it had started to smell. And uh, we were just driving down the high street uh, one afternoon. My mate Alkesh was in the front passenger seat, arm on the, um, you know, kind of, you know, arm on the door like a gangster, and um, window down. And I said, Alkesh, Alkesh, get rid of it. It just stinks so bad, stinks so bad. And so he kind of grabbed it, and he was just about to chuck it out the window onto the high street when I said, no, do you know what would be even better? Unscrew the lid first. (laughs) And then when it hits, it'll explode and go everywhere, and it'll be amazing. So everyone thought this was a great idea. So everyone was saying, yeah, throw it at that guy. Throw it there. Throw it at that shop. Throw it at that person. And everyone was screaming at Alkesh, and he was kind of looking at all these things and trying to work out what to aim at. And in the end, he kind of panicked and just threw it as hard as he could. And we all looked to see where it was going to land. But somehow, and I still don't know how, the bottle flicked backwards <laughs> out of his hand and flicked into his face face and it exploded all over him all over his clothes all over his face and all over the rest of the car and there was that moment where I remember thinking I thought it would smell much worse than oh my as the smell just spread all over the whole car and it was awful it was a three-door hatchback there's no quick way out of a three-door hatchback we were complete I thought the smell was so bad I was gonna die It's the only time, I think, in the history of the world that a Vauxhall Nova has been written off by a milkshake. We couldn't get it clean. There was no way of getting the smell out. He was aiming at a number of things. He thought he wasn't sure where to aim, and he ended up hitting himself in the face. And actually, sometimes when you're not sure what you're aiming at, you end up hitting yourself. The default is to aim for yourself, to aim your ambition for yourself. And that's the first kind of ambition Paul writes about in this passage. He says, he talks about those who set their minds on earthly things, who just want things for themselves. He calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. Their glory is in their shame. Their God is their stomach. Their destiny is destruction. They have no eternal perspective. It's all about grabbing for themselves what they can get. It's fascinating, isn't it? He talks about, he talks about their glory, their stomach, even their destiny. 
He's, they're aiming at themselves. And the thing is, if you're aiming at the wrong target, it doesn't help if you hit it. It doesn't help. If you're not aiming at the right target, it doesn't help if you hit it. And I've experienced that, just to be quite honest with you. When I was growing up, I actually, if you stripped everything away, I had two core ambitions. I wanted to make a name for myself, and I wanted to be really, really rich. I wanted to make loads of money. I love the idea of having a house with a swimming pool. I desperately wanted a car as nice as my mate Satch's. You know, I, I just wanted to make lots of money. And I actually had a figure in mind. I thought I, at the height of my dad's working life, he'd earned a certain amount of money a year. And I thought if I could earn that much money, that would be great. That's where I focused. And I worked hard. I pushed towards that goal. I drove myself. And I tried to achieve it. And then to my surprise, I worked hard, I caught a few breaks, but to my surprise, after my first year of working life, I realized that I hadn't only hit the goal, I'd earned three times as much as my dad in the first year of work. I'd hit the target, I'd hit the bullseye, but I didn't feel happy about it, I didn't feel excited, I didn't feel any sense of joy, I just felt empty. So I thought, I've obviously been aiming at the wrong thing. Maybe I wasn't aiming high enough. And I looked at colleagues who were aiming, earning 10 times as much as I was. And I thought, oh, maybe that's where I should be aiming. Maybe I, should, maybe, maybe I just need to readjust my goal and try and earn more and more and more. And I did that for a while. And it started to consume me. All I was thinking about the whole time was how to earn more money. It started to shape my week, shape my time. Everything was focused on that goal. And I came to a revelation, a realization that I, I needed to work out what I was aiming at. I was either aiming to be rich or I was aiming to be generous. But I needed to know. You need to know what you're aiming at. Because it, it's ambition, it's not wrong to earn a lot of money. It's not wrong to want to be the most, uh, the, the most senior person in your field. It's not wrong to earn a lot of money if your goal is to earn that money so you can use it generously to impact people's lives, maybe to seed fund projects that couldn't get up off the ground without you. It's not wrong if you want to become the most senior person in your field, if you want to shape that field, that whole sector with influence for Jesus Christ. If you want to shape the values so that they more closely align with the values of God, they're great ambitions to have. But you need to know what you're aiming at. And you need to know why you're aiming at those things. Your life will follow your ambitions, so you need to know where they are aimed. You start off and you refine yourself to try and reach your ambitions. And then quite soon, your ambitions come to define you. That's how it works. You need to know where they're aimed. And it's interesting with the Apostle Paul, he was always highly ambitious. Before he encountered Jesus, he was full of zeal. Literally, he was focused, driven, so ambitious towards a single aim. He was actually an enemy of the cross of Christ. His one goal, his one aim was to persecute the church and see Christians driven from the face of the earth. And he went hard after it. He did all he could to achieve that ambition. He went from town to town, driving out the Christians, arresting them, beating them. He became the persecutor in chief in that whole region. He was focused. He even... It shaped him to the extent where he oversaw the murder of a guy called Stephen, and he approved of it. I'm called Stephen. My little brother's called Paul. I thought, he loves this passage. <laughs> find that quite difficult. But then he encountered Jesus, and his life was transformed. He understood God's love for him. He experienced his new identity as a much-loved child of God. But what's interesting is that he didn't then suddenly become inactive or passive. He was still passionate to change things. 
but he wanted to change things for Jesus. He wanted to target towards God. He started with his own heart. He says, I've not already obtained what I need to. I've not yet taken hold. I'm not yet perfect. He sees, still sees the mismatch between the way things are and the way things can be. And he wants to do something about it. But now he's so captivated by Jesus, he directs his whole life to knowing Jesus, to experiencing intimacy with Jesus. He's striving towards the day when the Jesus kingdom will fill the whole earth. When we will know the reward of seeing him face to face. That's where he's aiming now. He realizes that true ambition isn't about getting what you want. It's wanting what God wants. Your ambition isn't a, a, a kind of disease to be destroyed. It's a desire to be directed. What are you aiming at? You see, lots of people think it's better to have really small ambitions. That must be the most humble. That must be the, the, the best thing. To just have really small ambitions. I'll just have a nice life. Uh, do okay at work. Come to church every now and again. Pray a prayer. Be a nice person. Surely that's a good ambition. Yeah, it's a good ambition. It's not your best ambition. Godly ambitions are bold. Godly ambitions scare you a bit. Godly ambitions are great because our God is great. If your ambition is not beyond your grasp, it's unlikely to glorify God. The size of your ambition tells you the size of the God you believe in. And our God is great. And so great ambitions honor him. So today, leave behind the small ambitions and ask God to give you a great ambition for him. Ask him to give you a great ambition. Take aim. But also take hold. Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Jesus took hold of Paul for a purpose, for a reason. He took hold of him for a purpose. You know, Jesus took hold of you for a purpose. I wonder if you believe that this morning. Maybe you want to turn to your neighbor, just encourage them. Say, Jesus took hold of you for a purpose. Now turn to the person on the other side, you don't want to feel left out, just say, don't worry, Jesus took hold of you for a purpose too. <laughs> Jesus took hold of Paul for a purpose, but Paul knows it's not just going to drop into his lap, it's not just going to flop there easily. Paul knows he's going to have to take hold of it, and Paul says he's going to have to press on towards the goal. The word he uses is like the finish line. It's like, it's like he's a sprinter bursting out of the blocks, fixing his eyes on the finish line and pounding the track as he races towards it. All that, all that energy, all that drive that he used in his old ambition is going to be used in his new godly ambition. Exactly the same vigor, exactly the same effort. Pounding the track, straining every muscle, making every possible effort. The truth is that ambitions which glorify God are not going to be easy to accomplish. That doesn't mean it's all up to you, but it does mean it's going to take focus, drive, strain, effort, and perseverance. Paul wasn't, it's worth saying, Paul wasn't riding a wave of popularity when he started to take hold of this ambition for God. That's not where he was. He didn't have buy-in from all the key influences in the region. Paul was called to preach the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord, at a time when the region in which he was preaching was ruled by the Roman Empire, one of the most powerful empires the world has ever seen. And their ruler, their leader, Caesar... They called Lord. 
Jesus Christ is Lord, Caesar is Lord. There's going to be a bit of a clash. It's not going to be easy. Plus, those religious leaders who had trained Paul, who had raised him, had disowned him and felt that he was running. He was running a movement which was dangerous and should be stamped out. He only had a few people with him and he had to move around quickly from town to town because people kept trying to take him out. Five times he's whipped, three times he's beaten with rods, once he's stoned, three times he's shipwrecked. He spends a night and a day in open sea. He faces danger in rivers from bandits. He spends a lot of time without food and drink, sleep or even clothes. Plus, he faces opposition from his fellow apostles and even falls out with those closest to him. The temptation to give up must have been huge. I mean, he'd been to Cyprus. Why not go to the beach, have a glass of wine, chill out? I've tried the great ambition, God. Everyone hates me. Everywhere I go, they're angry with me. I'm just going to stop and try something a bit more relaxing. But opposition, opposition can weaken your strength, but it can also strengthen your resolve. Just because you're struggling doesn't mean you're failing. Every kind of great ambition requires some sort of struggle to get there. Don't let people put you off. There's no shortage of people in this world who will tell you that you can't achieve your ambition. They're everywhere. Oh, it's not the sort of thing that happens. It's not that easy. Things don't change in that way. There's a reason things have to be the way they are. When I was... A, a kind of a, a student in Luton, people would say to me, well, Steve, people from around here don't really go to university. I wouldn't aim for that. When I went to university, people said to me, well, Steve, people with your accent don't really become barristers. I wouldn't aim for that. <laughs> now, I'm a, now I'm a curate here at HDB. People say to me, oh, well, you know, the church is receding in this country. I wouldn't aim for boosting that. And I just say, no, I will aim for that. Because God's promises are irrevocable. And he says, I will build my church. And he will build his church whatever happens. That is bankable. I'm not aiming for that. I'm not aiming for that because of a skill set. I'm aiming at that because I'm sure of a saviour who is sovereign. He is Lord. And he decides what happens. And if he says he will build his church, he will build his church. So don't listen to those who say it can't be done. Find people who aren't intimidated by your ambition, but who are inspired by it. And come alongside them and let them come alongside you. Paul isn't put off. He says, forgetting what is behind, he strives towards what is ahead. You can't strive forwards if you're still looking backwards. Paul had made more mistakes than anyone here today. He'd made more mistakes than you. He'd watched over the murder of a Christian. He'd fallen out with people. He'd stuffed up more times than he could remember. But he doesn't look back. He looks forward. You can't strive forwards if you're looking backwards. But you you just can't carry regrets with you. You can't live in the past. If you're fixated on your past failures, you will forsake your future. Don't replay your regrets. Fix your eyes on the finish line. And remember, you're not on your own. Sometimes we think when we we get this sense of this great ambition that God's given us, we think it's like God gives it to us and says, off you go, let's see how that works out. Is it going to go well or badly? You know, phone and let me know. No, it's not like that at all. He is right there alongside you. When God calls you to a great ambition, he makes it come to pass. What does that look like? My dad was uh, born and bred in Barnsley. And he actually really struggled at school. He was severely dyslexic. He found it quite hard to read and write. And so he left school at 15 and went to work in the mines, actually. And he became a Christian. um, And suddenly he felt this really strong ambition 
to go and tell people in China about Jesus. The only problem was he was in Yorkshire. And he didn't speak Chinese. But he went to Bible school anyway. And uh, it would have been quite difficult, but he, 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 he met a woman there who was a teacher, actually. And they learnt Chinese. They learnt Mandarin together. My mum. And then they said, right, we're going we're gonna to go and be missionaries. But it was a difficult time. And they, they applied to missionary society after missionary society after missionary society. And every single one of them turned them down. But by a number of amazing coincidences, they, uh, they, they, they managed to get together the funds to take themselves there, to go there under their own steam. And they were so excited about it, they couldn't believe it had all fallen into place. And then just after they booked the tickets, as they were about to leave, it was in the 70s, and currencies were in crisis, and the Bank of England imposed currency control. They couldn't get their money changed. They'd hit a brick wall. The trip was off. And my dad was just so devastated. And he'd been asked to go up and speak at a church in Birmingham, so he went up miserable. He spoke miserably. He sat down after the service miserable. And the church was emptying out, and he just sat there fed up. And this guy kind of walked in and looked a bit lost, but my dad wasn't really in the mood for a conversation. So he, he said, I'm so sorry that the service is finished. This guy looked a bit disappointed, kind of looked around. And he said, oh, well, that's a shame. I, I, don't, I don't actually ever come to this church. I go to a church on the other side of Birmingham. But today, for some reason, I was driving past, and I just felt I should come to this church. And my dad said, yeah, I'm really sorry the service is finished. <laughs> a bit miserable. And... There was this long pause, and the guy just kind of looked at my dad, and he says, I know this sounds really odd, but I'm actually head of currency control at the Bank of England. Is there anything I can do for you? Monday morning, my dad walks into the Bank of England, they get their currency, they go. I've lost count of the number of people who know Jesus in mainland China because of their testimony, because of their witness. You are not on your own. Take hold. Don't give up. Even the greatest obstacle can become the very means of God fulfilling the ambition he's given you. Paul writes this letter desperate to see people come to know Jesus from a prison cell. That's quite a big obstacle. But the only reason we have this letter, the only reason millions upon millions of people have literally come to know Jesus Christ through this letter is because Paul was in a prison cell. God can use the greatest obstacle to you achieving your ambition as the very means by which he brings it to come to pass. That's his power at work. And you might doubt your strength, but he is faithful. He's at work. The Spirit is at work in the world and he wants you to use, he wants to use you in his great global ambition to see the name of Jesus lifted high. He wants to use you to shape your workplace, shape your family, shape your area, wherever he has placed you, whatever industry, whatever sector, so that this might be a place where the name of Jesus is honoured. So that this city might be a city which resounds to the glory of God. So that this nation might be a nation where the name of Jesus is lifted high. And the world might declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. So take aim. Take aim. Ask for a great godly ambition today. And take hold. Persevere. Don't let go. Because he who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Bear Grylls. My favorite way to start the day, the Bible in one year. That's how wild I am. Find out more at BibleInOneYear.org or download the Bible in One Year app.